Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for uh, participating in today's program. This is a program, I've done this kind of program for a really long time, and I always like talking about Wayland. It's one of my favorite subjects about Monterey. One of the things that got me interested in Monterey history, actually. Well, I grew up in Monterey, and I've always had that interest. And I worked for the Monterey Bay Aquarium when they first opened um, way, back, way back when, 120 years ago. And they did their first temporary exhibit called Whale Fest. Some of you may remember that, and uh, part of that was two living history pieces about whaling in Monterey, and I was brought in to write those two pieces about whaling, and we did one on 19th century Portuguese shore whalers and one on a 20th century uh, whaler at Moss Landing. Both subjects I'll talk about today, but uh, that really got sort of lit this little light bulb up in my head about all this, so we're going to see if we can, what we can get going here. But the wedding story is, is 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 a little different here in Monterey than it is in a lot of the places. And it played a little, at one time in the 18th century, 19th century, uh, whaling was very important to the world's economy. The world ran on whale oil, so whale oil was a big, big business. Anybody who's been to the East Coast, spent time in cities like uh, Nantucket and New Bedford, uh, where the where it was a big whaling economy, and you. Is there every I would went to a conference in New Bedford uh, several years ago, and what stuck out to me uh, at every corner there was one time a bank with all support of the whale industry here. So we're gonna so, so, so when it goes back a long time in Monterey, uh, and not so much with the native people, but I do like to start here, like I do with most of my talks. Uh, the native people, the Lumpkin people of Monterey, weren't whalers per se. Uh, they were fishing people. That's how they made their living. Uh, this wonderful drawing, which I've shown many times, but it was done uh, by an unknown Spanish artist in the 1790s. And I love this drawing because it really shows their connection to the bay uh, that you, know, you can just see what she's wearing with the with the the tule skirt and the and then the uh, in front of the tule skirt you can see here this would be uh, cow hide or deer hide and these black spots would be abalone pendants and the cape that she's wearing is probably sea otter pelt and the necklace that she's wearing is olivella shell and the olivella shell abalone earpieces that she's wearing uh, but they didn't they were fishermen uh, as I mentioned. We're not moving here. Hang on. So they were fishermen. Uh, they were all, and they fish. Everything was out there in the bay. I, I like to say they were the first commercial fish in Monterey. Uh, they were also diving abalone in Monterey, the first abalone divers. Uh, but whales certainly played an important part of their life. I mean, they ate them when when one would wash up onto the beach, which happened often. <laughs> Uh, they would certainly use them. Uh, the fat would be melted down. They'd use the fat for almost like a butter. And, and but my favorite thing about uh, whales and the Lumpson people is the word they had for whale. And the word was tip. And that was the word for whale for the Lumpson people, which I think is a cool thing, actually. Uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way here. So, again, they were hunters as well. Very excellent hunters, understood how to utilize the bay, understood how to use the land here. And we can trace the native culture into the Monterey for almost 10,000 years. So they truly understood how to live here and utilize all the resources that were here. Of course, the was part of Spain, Spain arriving here in 17. They were not whalers. Uh, 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 they weren't fishermen. They didn't understand how to utilize the bay so much out here. Uh, Mexico declares independence from Spain in 1822. It took a year for that news to get to Monterey. 1823, Monterey then becomes part of Mexico. And, um, and what they did, of course, is they opened the port. Spain, of course, kept the port closed. But Mexico opened that port, allowed ships to come in. Uh, in particular, uh, ships coming from the United States bring all kinds of cargo. You name it, they brought it with them. Uh, and, but they also, a lot of whaling ships are coming in, coming in from the East Coast, going in, now venturing into the Pacific. Uh, ships from all over the world, whaling ships. And those whaling ships, by the way, were multicultural. I mean, I've read accounts of, of Monterey in those days, and you'd hear all these different languages as you walk down the street. Uh, and uh, and the people used to refer to those whalers uh, as spouters. 
the uh, Rasa of the East refer to them here in Monterey. And so they, uh, so they would, uh, oftentimes the whaling ships would come in and they would trade for good water, wood, that kind of thing. And they would trade these tripods, you see right here. This is a tripod. Uh, you can see this is a fairly large iron pot. It's flat on that one side because this was designed to go up against the bulkhead of a ship. And this is what they boil down all that whale blubber in these in these tripods. Well, the ships that had more than one, they would have extra ones and they would trade these to get water, to get firewood here in Monterey. And of course, the Californios would use these uh, in the hide and trap tallow trade, and they would boil down uh, cow fat in these in these pots. And if you know anything about the hide and tallow trade, anybody who's read Richard Henry Dana's book two years before the mass, and if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Uh, Dana's descriptions of Monterey in the 1830s are the best descriptions that exist uh, about Monterey. And he hated Monterey, hated California, but he wrote wonderful descriptions of the life here of the people here. And the whole hide and tallow trade is while these ships are coming in to California, uh, into Monterey, which of course to get cow hides, because the Californios were into raising cattle. They're into raising beef. That's what they did. Uh, they didn't understand how to utilize the bay. And so they'd raise, they would raise cattle and sell these cow hides. Uh, the cow hides uh, were referred to as Californio bucks. Each cow hide represented $1. And they went up along the, the sailors and went up along the beach there near the custom house and passed these cow hides over their heads one by one, like you see in this picture. Perhaps you've all heard that term. We're passing the buck. We're passing that California buck. And they go back onto the ship, eventually making their way back to the East Coast, mostly to Boston and to New York, where they'd be turned into other products, in particular leather shoes. But to me, uh, the most important product were big leather conveyor belts. It went into factories that turned machinery parts. And the other products eventually come to California. So all kinds of works like in the big circle here. <clears throat> Chinese fishermen arriving here in the early 1850s also were not whalers, but they did utilize everything that appeared in the bay out there. They did understand that part of it. Uh, and they also certainly utilize any whale that washed up onto their beaches, which would happen from time to time. So whales certainly played a part in their life as well. Around the same time that these whalers arrived in Monterey, about 1852, 1853, this gentleman and his wife arrived here. The gentleman's name is John Pope Davenport. John Pope Davenport was a New England whaler from New Bedford, Massachusetts. If you ever read Moby Dick or seen the movie, that's his story. All right, about 1853 or so, he had just got married and married the young woman. Her name was Ellen. Uh, he, uh, John Davenport was about 50 at the time, uh, and she was about half his age. And, well, you know, she didn't want to go on these long three, four, or five-year whaling cruises anymore. Uh, you know, she wanted him to stay home, and he wasn't ready to retire. So he says, honey, let's compromise. I mean, that is the basis of any good marriage, right? You compromise. And so he said, let's move to California. Let's move to Monterey. And so he packed up his wife. He packed up a Portuguese whaleman who worked for him along with some whaling equipment. And they came and sailed to Monterey, came into Monterey Bay, and they moved into this house you see right here. Of course, this is the first brick house. Um, the house was built by getting Gallon Dickinson. Dickinson came to California, came to Monterey via the Donner Party. If you know that story of the Donners, of course, it was a big group of people, a wagon train. And when they got to Salt Lake City, uh, uh, half that group or a small part of that group said, hey, we heard this new shortcut going through the Sierra Nevadas. We're going to go that route. The other half said, no, no, we're not taking that chance. We're going to take the old way around the southern part. He went the old way, so he did get stuck in the Sierras, but he got to and he came to Monterey, looked around, said, I'm not living in some old adobe. Heck with that idea. And he had these bricks made here in Monterey and built this brick house. But he never lived in it because gold was discovered on the American River. And uh, he took off for the gold fields. When Davenport arrived here in Monterey, uh, the house was empty. He was able to acquire or rent the house. And he moved into it with his wife, Ellen, and his Portuguese whaleman. 
uh, put an ad in the local newspaper looking for whalers. Now, there are no whalers living in Monterey in the 1850s, uh, but he was able to find a crew, uh, and they spent a season mostly him training these guys how to whale, and they had a lot of problems and a lot of mishaps, uh, and the, the price of whale oil dropped at one point. So after that first season, he kind of shut it down, the operations here, and he left Monterey and uh, went down to Mexico to a place called Scammon's Lagoon. Scammon's Lagoon is where the uh, gray whales go to, to every year to, to cap their, their, their baby, their gray whales, where they go down to cap their whales every year. And it was actually discovered by Charles Scammon, who was a whaler. And uh, he spent a couple of seasons down there. And then eventually, uh, Davenport does come back to Monterey uh, and has a whaling station up uh, near the first theater, actually in the first theater. Um, but around that same time, a group of uh, Portuguese whalemen in the 18th century and 19th century, when whales and whaling products were something this country really needed to have, the big whaling company out of Nantucket and New Bedford would go on those three, four, and five-year whaling cruises. Usually the first place they went to were the Azores, which the little islands off the coast of Portugal, and pick up these Az Azorean whalers who are known to this day to be great whalers and sailed on the eastern seaboard and around the Cape Horn and up the California coast, all the way up to Alaska, all the way across the Pacific to Japan. And they wouldn't return to their home port till they filled the hold of their whaling ship with whale oil. And this could take up to five years until you got home. But something happens in California in 1848, gold's discovered on the American River. And all these whale ships come into San Francisco. I mean, let's face it. Let's say we are all part of a whaling company out of Nantucket. Had to smell dead whale every single day for the last two years. And they told you there was gold up in hills for the taking. What are you going to do? Heck, with that whaling, I'm getting me some of that gold. That's exactly what these Azorian whalers did. When they got to those gold fields, though, they found out that it wasn't as easy as they were told. So they said, the heck with that. I'd rather be whaling. So go back to San Francisco. But they have no money because they didn't get any gold, and they have no way to get home because everyone abandoned their ship. So they're kind of stuck. So around 1854 or so, 17 of these guys are sitting around the pier in San Francisco and heard about Mr. Davenport's operations in Monterey. One guy goes, yeah, Monterey. Sure looked a lot like home, and there are a lot of whales down there. So why go down from San Francisco and set up a whaling station at, uh, right next to the brick house there, and began whaling what they called, they called the old-fashioned way, in little teeny 28-foot boats, six guys in a boat. Can you imagine hunting a 100-foot blue whale in a little teeny boat like this? This is how they would do it. They'd row or, or sail out to the whaling grounds, they'd see a whale, the guy at the bow here would yell out, Balea, which means whale in Portuguese, fired this gun called the Greener's Gun, because it was invented by a guy named Greener, has a harpoon in it with a rope attached to it that was attached to the boat. Now, this gun was not designed to kill whales, but in fact, it was designed to slow them down. Now, if you're a whale and hit with a sharp harpoon like this, what are you going to do? Sometimes these whales would turn and sink these boats or sound or dive to the bottom. These guys would fast enough and cut the rope. They got dragged down with them. But most of the time, the whale will start running through the bay dragging these guys behind them for hours at a time. And all the people that lived in Monterey in those days would wind up along the coastline and watch these guys get dragged through the bay. They used to call that a Nantucket sleigh ride. Finally, the way would slow down, they hit it with big long hand harpoons, and yes, they would kill it, and that was the name of the game. Then usually the way will sink, so they'll put markers out there because it will float back to the surface about 10 days later. Anybody ever raised goldfish? You know how that works out there. And then they would tow it back to the beach where they'd ship off all the blubber because all they're after was the blubber. Uh, and it, so the whaling business was very dangerous. They usually went out with two boats in case there was a problem. Uh, they would work with two boats. But there's been a lot of written descriptions about whaling. And I want to read you a couple of them. In 1862, there's a guy named William Garner who came to Monterey. He was with the, with the geological survey team that from the United States government that came to, to do a survey of California, and they spent time in Monterey. And Brewer, who wrote this, another great book called Up and Down California, uh, wrote this about Monterey whaling. By the way, Monterey Bay is a great place for whaling. 
Two companies are at work and already over half a dozen whales have been taken here. On Wednesday, we saw them towing one in and on Thursday morning went down to see them cut him up. He was a huge fellow, 50 feet long. Last year, they caught one 93 feet long and made over 100 barrels of oil. After stripping off all that blubber, the carcasses are towed into the bay and generally drift up on the southeast side. The number of whale bones on the sandy beach is astonishing. The beach is white with them. Hundreds of carcasses have there decayed, fattening clouds of buzzards and vultures. The whales are covered with thick black skin. The tail is horizontal. They have no fins but a pair of huge paddles, one on each side, oars as it were, like great flat arms covered with skin, three or four feet wide and 12 or 15 feet long. The ball and socket joint which attaches the paddle to the body is wonderful. The ball is as large as the end of a half barrel. The barnacles grow on the skin in great numbers. I will try to collect some if they do not stink too badly. That's the main reason they tow them off the beach there because the, the smell was absolutely horrendous. But as I mentioned, it very dangerous work. Uh, uh, this is from the Monterey Democrat, written December 31st, 1870. On Friday of last week, the crew of one of our whale boats narrowly escaped total destruction. They had struck and made fast to a California gray, a species of whale that described as particularly vicious, and were approaching him for a shot with a bomb gun. There were a lot of porpoises around the creature, which suddenly appeared to be gallied by them and paused in his race. The boat under sail and running swiftly got unawares within the sweep of the whale's tail, and when the shot was delivered, a stroke in response from that tremendous engine crushed like an eggshell the timbers of its bow. The sea rushed in through the fractures in the boat, being weighed down with her crew. An anchor and two heavy guns sank several feet below the surf. The captain had been struck in the side by a fragment of broken timbers and was almost paralyzed. In the confusion, for a moment or two, no one thought to cut the rope by which the fish was fast and had been and had resumed its flight. Light. A tragedy was imminent, but luckily the captain, recovering himself, ordered the rope to be cut, and the immediate and most pressing danger was escaped. The peril was, however, still considerable. Two of the crew could not swim, and they were all immersed to their necks in ice cold water. Once or twice the boat rolled over, and they were in that perilous condition for half an hour before their consort, which was at some distance, heard their cries and came to their rescue. So very dangerous work. <laughs> These guys did that kind of work. So in 1874, this key, this very key, changed the history of Monterey forever. This is a switch lock key from the Southern Pacific Railroad. This is the key that opened the lock, that pushed the track, that brought the train to Monterey. So what comes with the train are people. And now we got a way to get fresh fish to the big market in San Francisco. Now we got other folks coming to fish in Monterey, in particular the Italians, not the Sicilians, but the Genovese coming to work in the gold fields, coming or coming down from San Francisco or coming across the bay from Santa Cruz to fish primarily for rockfish. Well, those Chinese fishermen that come earlier, as I mentioned, the fishermen really out there had learned years before. Uh, that squid are nocturnal and 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 they didn't want to compete with these guys and so initially they would go out in the bay to fish at the, in the daytime uh, and these and these genovese fish are also going out there so there was a lot of competition out there at that time and and so the portuguese whalers were also going to make their way out in that bay uh, weren't real happy with all this. And so for some reason they they went after the Chinese fishermen. The fish would go out and lay out their nets and then the Portuguese whales go and they would cut the net. And so this happened a number of times. And so finally the Chinese fishermen uh, came into Monterey and were able to get a, 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 a Caucasian guy here in Monterey who said, you know what, I'll go out on the boat with you and I'll be a witness so you can sue these Portuguese whalers. And so they agree and they take the guy out and he hides down below in the boat. They cover him up in a little piece of in, uh, fabric, a piece of canvas. And they go out, they lay out their net. And as soon as they do, this Portuguese whale boat comes up and cuts that net. And as soon as they do, they pop up. This guy pops up and goes, aha, I see you. I'll be a witness for these Chinese fishermen. 
and we'll take them and they'll take you to court, which they did. And the judge agreed that they were that the Portuguese whalemen were wrong. They were cutting their net. But because the Chinese fishermen could not speak English, they could not speak for themselves. He ruled in favor of those Portuguese whalers. So the so the fishermen, Chinese fishermen, saw the writing on the wall and said, heck with you. We'll just start fishing for squid at night because nobody wanted squid then. Squid was considered to be a junk fish. So while the Italians are home sleeping, the Chinese are fishing for squid, all created by these Portuguese whalers. Of course, today, the California squid fishery, economically anyway, is the largest fishery in California today. So of course, uh, they're getting gray, mostly gray the humpbacks, what they're getting here in Monterey. And so all they wanted was a blubber. That's all they are after. A good California gray whale will bring in uh, uh, about, a good California gray whale will produce about 40 barrels of whale oil. A barrel in those days was about 36 gallons of whale oil. In 1870, a back gallon of whale oil sounds about 75 cents a barrel. So you, uh, 70, 75 cents a gallon. And so you got uh, 40 barrels of 36 gallons each. That adds up to quite a bit of money at that time. So it was a very, very profitable business. Also, it was a very, very competitive business. Uh, in whaling world, there were two seasons uh, for the whalers. There was what they called the going down season, which was in the fall, when, when the gray whales were migrating south to Mexico, to Scandal's Lagoon. And there was a coming up season, which was in the spring, when they're coming back uh, with their calves at that time. And, and of course, then they would come and they would, they would harpoon the whales when they would go to get them, they tie a rope behind his tail. They would tow them back to the beach. It usually took all day uh, and the two boats to do that work. And they'd bring them in high tide. That's when they'd bring the whales in and it'd wrap up in this rope and cable. And then the, the harpoonist on the boat and on the whale boat, uh, uh, the harpoonist and, and, the, and the guy at the bow, the guy who's fighting that greener's gun, are the guys who make the most money on the boat. And usually the whale company, there's about 13 guys in a whale company, uh, enough guys to fill two boats and, you, and a guy who was the signal man. So they also had guys who were stationed at shore, usually on, on a bluff somewhere. In Monterey, there was actually a, 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 one of the whale companies had a guy on the roof of the first theater and they would, it would, they would signal with a flag and, they, and the boat also had flags pointing in the direction where the whales were. So they bring the whales in, make the cuts, wrap it up on this cable you see here, then run it through this eye hook you see here. This is still there uh, uh, near the Monterey Harbor. So if you walk along the bike trail, the walking trail, uh, if you know where that mural is, it depicts where the Winnipeg Sarah Landing is. With the, that old, that's the old right away, right away from the Southern Pacific Railroad. And what you're walking on really is landfill. Uh, so at one time that was a much larger beach and went much further up. And they and they came in after 1887, blasted all, blast all that out to build the right away. Uh, but they run that rope and cable through that eye hook into into a what they call a capstan, and they would and it, like a big block and tackle, and they turn that capstan, and the whale will spin in the water, and the blubber comes off like a big orange peel. And so the, this is the old whaling company, as I mentioned. Here's the brick house, and they open their businesses here. And uh, and the sign above the door says Monterey Old Monterey Whaling Company, and they call themselves the Old Whaling Company because they were whaling the old-fashioned way. Uh, if you've been and seen this building today, of course, there's a, a, a balcony over here which was added in the 1920s. Uh, you note the cannon, by the way, he buried in the ground here. These are you'll use to find these all over Monterey, and they actually were buried there to use for horses and buggies to tie up to. And then the sidewalk in front of him, this is all whalebone sidewalk, which is still there today. That whalebone sidewalk, you can see. So this is uh, probably during the, uh, the, the uh, uh, th th this is the spring coming back, coming up season. So you can see the young whale here and then the, and then the mother female whale here. So the whales particularly like the springtime because they would get, get two for one, right? Uh, but as in the one of the reports that I read to you, they talked about 
how difficult it was that the gray whale was considered to be vicious. Uh, they actually referred to them as devil fish. She was very protective of her calf, uh, and uh, and they would go, she would go out to those boats. And there was a story, and I don't know how true the story was, but it did appear in one of the local newspapers uh, in the 1870s to talk about a whaling company that went out in the spring and, and saw a female and her calf, and they went out to the calf first and got that calf, and the, and the female went after the whaleboat and sunk that first whaleboat, dumped all those whalers into the water. Luckily, the, the other boat wasn't that far, and they swam to the other boat and got onto the other boat. She went out to that boat and sank that one as well. But those other, so all of a sudden, there's 12 whalers in the water there. Luckily for these guys, there was some Chinese fishermen out there who picked them up. And then, according to the newspaper, the, the, the gray whale chased those Chinese fishing boats all the way back to Monterey. And for a week, she cruised back and forth along the Monterey shoreline, not allowing any boat into the into the water that entire week that time but this is from a, a report a u.s government report written in the 1890s about fencing whales that usually the whales are stranded upon the beach where they're held in the edge of the surf while the process of fencing or cutting in as performed the blubber is taken off in large oblong flitches or square pieces one or more men standing upon a whale and cutting vigorously with sharp spades. When one side is stripped, the animal is rolled over by tackles. So again, you can see all the different equipment, uh, typical of a whaling company. And here's our, this is a whale gun that they, some of the companies would use. This was later, brought in later after the 1870s. Here's the greener's gun, the different kinds of harpoons, flensing tools, different kinds of harpoons. These are hand harpoons. Uh, you see right here, and then there is that flag that they would use uh, for the, the to signal. They also had a whaling station at Point Sur Light Station for a couple of years. And if anybody's ever gone to Point Sur or, uh, or been on the rock up there, uh, uh, as you know, the like Point Sur Light Station when they built it in the 1880s, they had to use dynamite to flatten that top up there to put the lighthouse. So, but there was a lot. There was a whaling station on the beach just adjacent to that. It, before they built the lighthouse in the late 1870s. And it only operated for a couple of seasons, partly because it was isolated down there. And anybody's been down there, I've been down there during, during in the spring, or you've seen lots of whales. In fact, I was down there last year in January, and one day counted over 100 spouts, you could see from there. Uh, but they were, uh, they would send a lookout up to the, onto the rock, at the top of the rock there. And he had with them, besides the flag, he had a rocket. And, uh, and when he'd see whale, he'd fire his rocket. Then the whalers would see the rocket and all run down to the beach to go onto the boat. And if you, you got a boat, by the way, you get paid. That's how you got paid. You had to get work and, and go out and, 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 and work these whales and bring it back across to them on the beach down there. Very hard work. And by the way, it was never full-time work either. It was always part-time work. And so these guys were, besides... Uh, they were they were also uh, farmers and dairymen and ranchers and other kinds of things. Uh, this is the whaling station, the Carmel Whaling Company, uh, 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 that was uh, initially opened in Monterey in 1861, and then and moved, or 1871, and then moved to uh, uh, 1870 61, and then in 1862 they moved to Point Lobos. And this wonderful painting done by Charles Scammon, uh, the whaler. You can see, if you know, you all know Point Lobos, of course, this is, is Whaler's Cove that you see right here. And, and Charles Scammon uh, wrote this wonderful description of this whaling station. He says, the localities of several of the stations are quite picturesque. Some of them are nearly concealed from seaward view, being inside some rocky reef or behind a jagged point with outlying rocks upon which each successive wave dashes its foam, as if forbidding the approach of ship or boat. The one which most interested us is half hidden in a little nook in the southern border of the Bay of Carmel, just south of Point Peter scattered around the foothills which come to the water's edge are the neatly whitewashed cabins of the whalers, all of whom are Portuguese from the Azores or western islands of the Atlantic. They have families with them and keep pig, sheep, goat, or cow following around the premises. These 
with a small garden patch yielding principally corn and pumpkins make up the general picture of the hamlet, which is a paradise to the 50 clan in comparison with the homes of their childhood. It is a pleasant retreat from the rough voyages experienced on board the whale ship. Now that is a beautiful description of the whaling ship you see right there. So here is my absolutely favorite painting in the history of Monterey paintings that exists today. Uh, this wonderful painting done in, in 1875, uh, of course, called The City of Monterey. It was actually done the idea of producing a poster out of it, but it never was. But I absolutely adore this painting uh, in which you see all this incredible things going on here. I could literally do a two hour lecture on just what you see in this painting here. There's two whale boats in the water here and they're pulling a whale behind them. Here's the Pacific Steamship Company Wharf right here. Monterey Wharf is right over here. Of course, here's the Monterey Salinas Valley narrow gauge coming into the station right here. And then there's the town of Monterey. And then here is all that whale bone on the beach that you see that we now call Del Monte Beach. And then here is a guy in a wagon. Uh, let's see, what has he got on that wagon? We'll look at a close up here. Just be pulling in that wagon. He's got whale bone on the back of that whale bone. So what is he doing with all that whale bone down there? He is selling all that whale bone with the producing things like this right there for the tourist trade that's coming to Monterey. Uh, they're producing all these kind of products. This is uh, the San Carlos Cathedral that's carved out of Monterey or out of whale bone. And of course, and with abalone inlay that you see right here, this actually is a candle holder for what they call a votive candle. Yeah, and uh, I actually founded this piece several years ago on eBay. Uh, eBay was the museum curator's absolutely best friend. At least it was at one time. Uh, you found things you thought you would never see. Of course, the person that was selling this didn't know what it was and they were selling it as crushed coral, but I knew exactly what it was. Um, this piece, by the way, you could go see this today. It's actually on exhibit in Terry Trotter's art gallery in Pacific Grove. And if you haven't gone to Terry Trotter's gallery, you should go. That, in my opinion, is the best museum in all of Monterey. Uh, the whole history of Monterey is in that art gallery. And uh, I really recommend you go to see it. But I'm going to back it up again because I love this painting. And, and, uh, and there's a, another description of that beach here. It says, this is for the Monterey Weekly Herald from May 30th, 1874, just around the time this painting was done. The beach around is strewn with the vast bones of these mighty enamels and appears as if the whole ocean had repeatedly poured into this last receptacle all its relics of cetacean mortality. Yet every year does this patrimony of whale decay still exhibit an increasing size, a fresh and wider boundary. One may travel miles through apparently endless rows of ghastly skulls, mighty ribs and vertebrae piled yards in height and white as monumental alabaster. Of course, as I mentioned, they're doing all kinds of things with this. Uh, besides making those trinkets for the tourists, they're also making the sidewalks. All the sidewalks in Monterey at one time were made out of, abel or out of whalebone. Uh, and here is the uh, last of it. That is, again, I took this picture just yesterday, and that is in front of the whaling station at Heritage Harbor. And that is all whalebone that you see right there. And that last of the whalebone. It's different colors because of different ages. And over the years, uh, tourists, other people have come and, and taken pieces out. And, and the building belongs to California State Parks. And to California State Parks credit, uh, they have replaced the stolen pieces with actual whale bones. So I, I am very pleased with that part. So, so some of those businesses, this is the uh, Daniel Duarte. Duarte family had a number of businesses along the Monterey waterfront that, tour, that cater that tourist trade. Uh, this is one of their many businesses, the Marine Museum. You see glass bottom boats, and you can see the abalone shells up here. Uh, Marine Museum, uh, a big giant sea star right here. Taxidermist, whalebone, book covers. And I have one of those book covers, uh, and, and it's 
cut whalebone and then and you go through it and it's tied with this beautiful little pink ribbon and when you go through the book is all the pages that have pressed seaweeds that were collected by women in pacific grove in the 19th century uh and they were collecting all the seaweed they're also collecting seaweed for the cal academy of of sciences and, and for UC Berkeley at that time. Then you can also see uh, a whalebone vertebrae here with a carbon mission painted on it, whalebone chair right here. I actually sat in one of these chairs. They're not very comfortable. Uh, here's another one of those businesses, Mr. Smith, who had a business in the first theater. Uh, and also came to that tourist trade. When the Hotel Del Monte opened in 1880, and uh, particularly all of the stops at those businesses and by their buy their trinkets to take home. You can see all the whalebone products behind them here. These three-dimensional mosaic, uh, three-dimensional cutout of the, of the Carnot mission here, uh, uh, all made out of whalebone with abalone inlay here and fancy rope work and all more abalone shell down in here. And if you know too, uh, the, the floor is all made out of sand down there. And then the Hotel Belmonte, which opened in 1880, uh, it was a fancy railroad hotel. By the way, they built this hotel in three months. It opened in June of 1880. It was at one time the fanciest hotel in the world. And what it really was, was, a, was what they called a winter hotel. It marked the hotel to the rich folks that live in Boston and Philadelphia and New York. Hey, you got those cold winters, come to Monterey. Spend a couple of months at the Hotel Del Monte. A lot of folks would do that. Now you got these folks coming to stay in your hotel. Well, you got to have stuff for them to do. So they uh, created that 17 mile drive and they had all kinds of games and beautiful gardens and eventually had golf and they had uh, polo and they had sport fishing in the Monterey Bay. It was, I've talked about this before in other programs, but it was sport fishing that really created and changed technology that really created the Monterey commercial fisheries in Monterey. Uh, uh, but they also uh, focused a lot on the whaling history in Monterey and the whaling fishery in Monterey. Uh, 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 and, and that was a big part of, of visiting the Hotel Del Monte. In fact, the whaling industry in Monterey was very profitable, as I mentioned, uh, uh, but it really began to slow down after 1874, uh, not because these guys took too many whales, because the truth is they never took that many. They lost far more whales than they actually ever got. Uh, but, there, but, uh, but what happened really was that other products were invented that began to replace whale oil. In particular, kerosene came on the market and they couldn't compete with that. And so they became full-time farmers, ranchermen, dairymen, other kinds of fishermen. It was Portuguese whalers that started the tuna fisheries in California. So next time you eat a tuna sandwich, you can thank a whaler for that. But I believe that there was one company uh, that continued to operate strictly for the tourists who were coming to stay at the Hotel Del Monte. I believe the hotel actually paid them, had a contract with a whaling company to whale strictly for their guests at the hotel. Uh, this is a newspaper story that appeared in the San Francisco Call, 1892. There she blows in Monterey Bay. And the story says, in the state who wish to witness the novel sight of capturing and killing a whale need not now repair to Alaska, but they may look out of their windows at the Hotel Del Monte at Monterey. And there on the broad bay, they can contemplate the curious performance. The manager's hotel is serene. He no longer yearns for a sea serpent or a low rakish craft displaying something in her mainsail, which are believed to be skull and crossbone. He has the whale fisheries in the attraction, which like Katasha's elbow in the opera of the Mikado, people come miles to sea. For whaling has become an industry at Monterey. All day long, there's a lookout stationed upon a bluffy headland above the beach, flying out over the sea with horizon, for there she blows. I don't know how much money these guys were making for a hotel, but I'm sure that's what they were doing out there. So this is a gentleman named Otto Saburu Noda. Uh, Noda, and I've talked about Noda a lot in this program, was a Japanese immigrant who came to Monterey in the, about 1896. And it was the guy that really created the Japanese fisheries here, uh, the Abalone fishery in particular, the man standing right behind him uh, uh, on the left there in, in, in his or I guess it'd be on your right, and the mustache is Janoske, this guy right here, Janoske Kodani. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, in, eight, in about 1900, uh, uh, Noda 
created, there was a need for whale oil in Japan and, co and, and NOTA created a small wedding company that operated out of Point Lobos and it was unique. And it was made up of Portuguese whalers and Japanese whalers. We know who those guys were. Uh, I've seen their names. Unfortunately, there are no photographs of his operation. At least I've never seen any of them. If they are, they would exist probably in Japan. Uh, um, only the, and the two companies, the Portuguese guys, and they're one company, but the two, and they worked together. Uh, they didn't speak each other's languages, but they all understood the language of whaling. Uh, they only operated for about a year, and then they had to shut it down. Uh, of course, there's our, our, our ama divers uh, who came uh, with from Noda's suggestion and Kodani's suggestion. Uh, this is a man named Edward Berwick. Edward Berwick was an uh, uh, interesting gentleman. Anybody who lives in Pacific Grove been to Berwick Park. And Edward Berwick uh, uh, was, a, uh, was a pacifist, a political guy. He had a big farm and ranch in Carmel Valley and grew exotic fruits and different kinds of things. And he was interested in history and interested in Monterey and and uh, actually wrote a number of little articles for a, a cosmopolitan magazine. Uh, one of those was an article about offshore whaling in the Bay of Monterey, which appeared around the same time as that story uh, from the San Francisco newspaper. And he wrote about this gentleman here, Captain Jose Pedro, ready to fire the harpoon. In fact, this image came out of that article. Uh, I was doing some other work and I ran across this story from the Salinas newspaper. Uh, about the same time, it says, the beaches and rocks in the city of the Silver Grove were lined last Saturday with spectators eagerly watching the maneuvers of a huge right whale, which was spouting within rifle range of the Chinatown Point. It could be easily seen that the whale was of mammoth size. Jose Pedro, the famous whaler of Monterey, and three sturdy fishermen started in a whaling boat in pursuit of the monster of the deep. The weather was rough, and they were led a chase far out beyond the head. A press dispatch sent out Saturday evening says, up to a late hour this afternoon, the men have not returned, and considerable anxiety is expressed for their safety. A terrible wind is now blowing, which is liable to increase to a small hurricane, so it will be a pretty hard night on the men if they have to weather it all night. If the whale is captured, it will net the men at least two thousand dollars as the smallest ever captured in monterey brought fifteen hundred dollars that was a lot of money these whalers actually uh, were treated like heroes they were really treated they were really treated like the sports heroes of their day if nike rolled on around in those days nike would have made whaling shoes air melville's so this is a man named Mike Noon, who was one of the later whalers on the turn of the 20th century. Mike Noon, among other things, was the sheriff of Monterey. He also worked on the Monterey Wharf. You can see, this is on the Monterey Wharf. You can see all the whale bone right there. Uh, this is a photograph that I found, uh, again, on eBay. A group of students you see here, uh, Hopkins Marine Station, actually, according to the photograph. And then I blew it up. You can see this is a Monterey whale boat right here about 1900 and i believe this is mike noon right there in that image and what he was probably hunting that whale right here this is mike noon's whale this whale was shot and, and immediately sank to the bottom of the bay after lying there for the past week it, it, it has at last risen to the surface now you can imagine the smell of that whale after that week Whew. <laughs> So that ended the whaling industry, really died out by the turn of the 20th century. Uh, but by, the, by 1915, technology had changed to the point uh, where there are new ideas of bringing other whaling operations into Monterey Bay. They brought in big steam powered whale boats and steam powered machinery. In fact, there was a company called California Sea Products. They're a Norwegian company. And they wanted to open in Monterey, in Monterey proper in 1915. Uh, but the Monterey sardine fishery, which was in its early stages at that point, uh, were very resistant. They said, no, no, you bring a whale fishery in here. Uh, they're convinced that it was the whales that were chasing the sardines into Monterey Bay, which, of course, wasn't the case. But they were convinced of that. And so, so the California Sea Park backed off. And then finally, in 1919, uh, they opened the whale fishery over in Moss Landing. And this photograph is uh, of their first whale they brought in. This is a sperm whale. It's the only sperm whale they actually got. 
And uh, so on the slipway you see here, they're bringing it into their cannery. And, uh, and, that, and the article, the newspaper story about this, the whale actually falls off this slipway at one point. And they had to bring in a helicopter to help bring it back up onto the slipway. They brought it in. At this point, they were processing and using all of the whale, all the parts of it. Everything was being used of this, including the whale bones. They were using all of it out there. The people go out to watch and see it, uh, but the smell was absolutely horrendous uh, uh, out there. People talk about how bad the smell was that you couldn't stay out there very long. This is another photograph that I found on eBay. And it just on the back, but it's, it, it says Archie and his friend uh, collecting uh, baleen. Uh, that, uh, they're on that slipway. That's what they're doing right there uh, in their suits uh, doing that. Of course, here's our friend Ed Ricketts. Uh, of course, that's not a whale, a, a giant uh, squid. But when Ricketts first came to Monterey in the early 1920s with his family at that time, he, of course, he was in the business collecting marine specimens that he was selling to high schools and colleges for for marine biology classes and dissection. He would go out to that landing station in Los Landing and collect monocles uh, and spend a long time out there. And uh, and when he came home, it, his wife uh, would 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 refuse to let him into the house until he stripped off all of his clothes and buried buried them into into the backyard. Uh, and this is inside that whaling station at Moss Landing you see right here. I believe this is a man named Bill Lehman, who I interviewed. I interviewed Bill Lehman maybe 30 some odd years ago, and he was about 100 then uh, when I interviewed him. And Bill was uh, the la head flincer for that whaling station. And uh, he talked about the smell. He said the smell was so bad. They worked like six days a week, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. And he said the smell was so bad. He said, no, ma no matter how many baths you took, you went to the movies, everybody knew where you worked. And also in those days uh, in Moss Landing, the one night they'd get off, which is usually Saturday night, uh, there wasn't a whole lot to do in Moss Landing. So they would go into Watsonville and the train would go through uh, for through Watson, through Moss Landing and go into Watsonville. So they all ride the train. But again, they smell was so bad, they'd make them ride on the outside of the train. So this way station lasted until uh, 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 1926 when it finally closed down. These guys are really good at what they did. Uh, but California Sea Party continued to operate. They had other whaling stations in California, and particularly in Northern California and Trinity, California. Uh, at California, they whaled in California. I don't know if anybody knows when the last whaling station actually closed. But, uh, but I'll tell you, the last whaling station, you may be surprised, the last whaling, whaling station in California actually closed in 1973 in Richmond, California. It was Del Monte Company, not connected to Del Monte Foods, and they were canning whale mostly for dog and cat food. But many of us through our life uh, have used whale oil, or your grandmothers or mothers have used whale oil in their sewing machines or, or lubricating machinery parts and things like that pretty common. All right. So, so another part came out of that whaling station was this. This is a label I actually found in the back of one of Popper's restaurant's guest books. This was a product for whale meat that came out of a California sea product. And they were shipping the tail to the Sea Pride cannery on Cannery Row, which was the only Japanese-owned cannery on Cannery Row. And they were canning that whale meat. According to the label, I had it translated that it's the tail of the whale that's packed in soy sauce, and it's delicious. Uh, what we don't know is where was it going? Were they shipping it to Japan? Were they shipping to Japanese trees along the West Coast here? I have given the label to Japanese historians that I know, and the Japanese keep really good records, uh, but they had never seen it. They only did this for about a year, so uh, we don't know. Um, it's, but it's a, it's a beautiful label, actually. So again, that's all whalebone. This is from the California Sea Products Company at Moss Landing. And all this whalebone was also utilized. It was all used to grind up uh, for fish or bone meal, things like that. Uh, of course, whale, whale. This is another one of my favorite things. This is a newspaper store ad that appeared in 1930 here in Monterey. Uh, 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 and it's starting at 36 at four o'clock, greatest exhibit of its kind in the world, Cap captive whale, 65 tons, 55 feet, and it's 18 foot, 6,000 pound baby whale, special steel glass enclosed car. This was in a 
in the train car and they're bringing it up to Monterey in the train car. This has the most wonderful biological study. Go see it at the Southern Pacific Depot track. Now I have to admit, I'm not sure if it was a real whale or not. I don't know uh, about how long it would have been there, but uh, it must've been something to see. Of course, basking sharks, sort of part of the story, uh, in the 19th century, Portuguese whalers were using basking sharks. They were also collecting oil from basking sharks, but they were also practicing their, their harpooning on basking sharks when they would appear in the bay, and they used to appear in the bay in huge numbers in the spring. This was taken oh, around the turn of the 20th century, a little before, a little after that, about 1905. This is a guy named, named Louis Perez. Louis Perez was then known as the Fish King. He was such a good fisherman, he used to hold dinners at the Hotel Almonte, sell stock in his fishing company. And evidently, this is such a curiosity, everybody went down to get their picture taken next to the basking sharks. You can see the net, how he brought it in. And then according to the paper, Louis Perez, I mentioned Louis Perez and his, his marine museum, he constructed a tent over this and we're charging folks 50 cents to go down there and look at it. That was a lot of money in 1905 or so. Uh, and it was there for 10 days. So our friend Papa and his adults are here, the abalone king. Uh, well, he had a whale uh, abalone boat for his abalone company and his good friend, Henry Leppert, who was a, a Frenchman and a blacksmith. Henry actually worked with the abalone industry. He also made, he made abalone, abalone prize for the, uh, for the abalone divers. Uh, but he also, you could go around to Old Monterey and still see Henry's work and fence work and grill work and, and things like that. But he and Henry had this idea of taking folks out from the Hotel Del Monte and Pop's abalone boat. And and, and in those days, there were, and this is 1924 and 25, there were a number of old Portuguese whalers still living in Monterey. And they would go out with them and they would tell stories of whaling in the Monterey Bay and then show these tourists how to throw harpoons, and they would harpoon basking sharks. <clears throat> uh, of course, in, in those days, the points would just bounce off the skin of that, of that harpoon, or off, that, off the skin of that, of that basking shark. The skin is like little teeth. Uh, and so, uh, <clears throat> and oftentimes, once they did harpoon it, uh, the boat was equipped with an air compressor. That was for the divers that were on the boat. And oftentimes they would pump the carcass of the dead shark with whale with air, with air, and then they would float to the surface and slip it on its belly. The Henry Leopard got on the belly of the shark and dance on the shark for all the tourists. <clears throat> so this is the Gilkey family, and the Gilkeys also were in the basking shark business. Pop was charging 50 cents to harpoon sharks. They were charging 25 cents, and they would jump on the shark and ride on it. And oftentimes, because the shark skin, as I mentioned, like little teeth, it would tear up their legs and they would do that. It was during the Depression. Here's, you can see that their boat was the two brothers. You can see it right here. And, and then uh, there's our basking shark in tomorrow. By the way, basking shark is the second largest fish in the world. Whale shark is the largest. As you can see, it has no teeth. Uh, here is another whale, a uh, basking shark fishery, uh, fisherman here. This was taken in 1948. Uh, by a guy named J.B. Phillips, who was a fishery biologist for California Department of Fish and Game with the harpoons out there. And, and they would use the barrel on the back. And, and so that's how they slow the animal down. So they harpoon it. It has a line on that harpoon on that pole, which hooks to that barrel, and it would jump into the water and then slow the animal down. And so what would they do with all those sharks? Initially, they weren't doing anything with it. Then a guy named Max Schaefer, who was in the reduction business, had a factory over in uh, where the Monterey Beach Hotel is today in Seaside, began to take the oil from the liver and the shark on the basking shark liver is huge. Can one of some can hundreds of gallons of oil in it. Uh, I, I, I talked to uh, one guy who got uh, oil, had uh, close to uh, 1500 gallons of oil in it. Uh, it would produce a stuff called sun shark liver oil, nature's own tonic. Uh, essentially, uh, it says it can be taken by babies and old people from a few drops daily for babies to a tablespoon for grown persons. According to age and size, it promotes health and growth in children, builds up resistance to attacks, the usual ailments of youth, and furnishes energy for the strength, strenuous exertions of youth. In older people, it is deferring troubles common with age, it enables them to keep on enjoying full bodily vigor and energy to perform their daily tasks. 
In other words, it was being advertised as the Viagra of its day, although I doubt it did anything. This is Anna Whitey Arbo. Uh, I, I knew Whitey Arbo, Whitey Arbo, a uh, bachelor fishery that was created early by Pop Ernest and that went on until uh, about 1938 and when Max Schaefer's factory died, burned down. And that was recreated uh, in 1948 when Whitey Arbo was out hunting, out fishing and uh, out off the marsh landing and uh, saw a couple of bass and sharks out there and he actually had a rifle with him and he shot them, brought them into Monterey and said, maybe I can do something with these. And so we went out and had a harpoon point made and then uh, went out and uh, recreated this whole fishery. He told me he went to a blacksmith and made this large harpoon point, which I actually have one of them. And uh, he went out and he built this, this piece on his boat and he threw it into the into the shark and just bounced right off of it. And then this piece broke and he went into the water. Uh, uh, but luckily they learned uh, diff uh, the little, little smaller points that work much better. And here is drawing a little smaller point. And they were uh, yeah, this is done by a fishing game biologist named J.B. Phillips, who wrote uh, this about this fishery. And they were and Newt Hogan, uh, Hogan's cannery had a cannery at Moss Landing. He began to buy these livers, and they were using the oil. Here's a shark coming into the into Moss Landing, and he's using the oil to sell to paint manufacturers and into into uh, soap manufacturers. But they learned when you put it in paint, the paint wouldn't dry, and you put the oil into the soap, the soap wouldn't lather. And so they're pulling the, the that's the liver being pulled out of the basking shark. And then in 1931, they made this movie called I Cover the Waterfront. And I, I know I've talked about this before. I love this movie. Uh, I, cover, I Cover the Waterfront, just quickly, is the story of some corrupt fishermen who were smuggling in Chinese fishermen into California uh, in the bellies of sharks. And so in the movie, they need to get some sharks. Uh, and so they didn't know what they were going to do. And then they heard of these bass shark fish were going on in Monterey. And so they had a film company up to Monterey. And they hired Captain Sal Coletto, who was a sardine fisherman, not a bass shark fisherman. And he's both the Dante Alighieri. And uh, they went out and they went out hunting bass sharks. And here is a scene from that movie. All right, all right. Give it to us. He can out eat, man. Good one. Dogs big enough to swallow a man. Why, why you fish for sharks when you do this, bro? There's no money in sharks. Yes. Okay. You don't roll like that. They run roll off, Dr. Uh, she said it. I'll say it's a big one. Throw it down. Let's go. Bring your harpoon line. We don't want to miss this one. He's a big cruiser. Easy, Capitan. Easy. Oh, my God. Oh, my All right. 
Look out! He's hitting for the bottom! Oh, they're both gone. I think that was right on top of him. Look out for you, Diggers! But that's enough of that. So, the man who's got you harpooning that shark is the son and grandson of Portuguese whalers from Monterey, the Ubassi shark fisherman, and that is the closest thing you'll ever see to a Portuguese whale hunt in Monterey Bay. So, I, again, I think I bored you guys enough. Uh, I want to point out that I do have a piece that I wrote uh, last year for the uh, Point Shore Life Station Volunteer Newsletter. It's a much longer piece about really about the whaling station that was at, at Point Sur, but it really has a whole history of whaling in Monterey Bay. If any, if, quite, it's, if anybody's interested in it, email me, and I'm more than happy to set, email you a copy of it. So anybody have any questions or anything? I know I've taken a lot of your time. I appreciate it, and thank you very much.